there's a, a quote that I like every man's life is a diary in which he means to write one story, but oftentimes writes another. His humblest hour is when he compares the story as it is with what he vowed to make it. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Dr. Joseph Maroon, thank you for agreeing to spend some time with us today. I guess my first question is, how do you spend your time these days? At the age of 83, are you still training, operating, teaching, and writing? Uh, three out of the above four, Tim. <laughs> I'm not operating, but I am teaching, I'm doing research, I'm mentoring, uh, and I am training. I, uh, I still train for triathlons, uh, not the distances I did before, but uh, I work out every day and look forward to continuing to race. When's the last time you did a triathlon? The last time was about a year and a half ago. Uh, I finished the the triathlon in Chicago. Uh, 5,000 people were in that triathlon. I won my age group. Can you please tell us how many triathlons and Ironman marathons you have done? Also, what is the difference between them? I will, but Tim, I know you fact check everything. So when I said I won the triathlon in my age group, I have to be honest and tell you, I was the only one in my age group, <laughs> but I did win. So, <laughs> but anyway, I've been doing triathlons for a long time and I've done uh, eight Ironman distance races and probably 80 or 90 triathlons over the last 30 years. And the Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, uh, 112 mile bike and a marathon. So I've competed five times in the world championship in Hawaii at, in Kona. Wow. That's amazing. And did you do that all at a, after a certain age or when did you start? Uh, I started when I was about 42 and I, I finished the Ironman distance races uh, about six years ago. Uh, 76, 77 was my last one. You're listening to Tim Green's nothing left unsaid. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider liking and subscribing to support us. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. I know you played football in high school and you received an athletic scholarship to Indiana University. Was that scholarship for football or something else? Well, it was for football. I, uh, I played in the Ohio Valley and with a couple of people that you may, know, you may have known, Tim. Uh, one was John Havlicek who subsequently played for the Celtics, and the other was Phil Negro, who was for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, we, both, we all played on the same baseball team together when we were in high school. They went on to the Hall of Fame in basketball and baseball, and um, I went to Indiana University on an athletic scholarship, football, with Scholastic All-American there, and uh, subsequently went into neurosurgery, thanks to football, actually. Why do you say thanks to football? Because I, I I wouldn't have gone to college when I grew up in the Ohio Valley. Uh, there were uh, Bridgeport, Ohio was 3000 people, 10 bars and 35 dogs. And I uh, you had three choices. You either worked in the steel mills, the coal mines or got an athletic scholarship. So I was fortunate to get an athletic scholarship, and that uh, got me into Indiana University and subsequently the 
into med school. With all of your accomplishments, I was wondering what drove you. What were you like growing up? Did you always want to be a neurosurgeon? No, I aspired to play football in college. That was my greatest aspiration. Uh, but I was, you know, God works in strange ways. And I was put into a dormitory with a group of pre-meds. And they asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I said, I want to play football. And uh, well, what else when you finish? I said, well, my father wants to be in a lawyer to keep him out of jail. And uh, they asked me how I did in science. I said, pretty good. Well, why don't we sign you up for medicine? And you can, if you don't like it, you can always drop down to law. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got Dr. Maroon, we're both lawyers. So you got it. You're outnumbered well, two to one. I know <laughs> that. I know that. <laughs> but you're also very competitive. And I was very competitive, too. And I was not going to drop down the law. <laughs> so I made it through med school. <laughs> I read that you were an academic All-American at Indiana who majored in anatomy and physiology. Did you have an academic mentor or a favorite professor who had a lasting impact on you? Well, actually, it was my football coach, uh, Coach Phil Dickens, who was the head coach of IU at the time. And uh, he he actually encouraged me uh, to to go into medicine. And uh, my my junior year, I started for Indiana and uh, I actually held the rushing record, five point three yards per carry. Until Randall L., who followed uh, several years later and joined the Steelers, broke my record. But I saw after my junior year that I was 5'6 and 160 pounds. So I was not about to play professional ball. And I started to hear footsteps. I didn't want to get hurt and uh, decided to it was time to hang it up, so to speak. And he was very encouraged me to do that. Yeah, you talked to your coach, and then he said you should look at doing medicine? Yep. That's interesting. M normally, coaches uh, aren't, <laughs> aren't as influential in academics, I'll say. Well, he was uh, a, a wonderful human being, great coach, built character and, and people. And, uh, and also, I saw that uh, they, they just recruited an individual who – was a, a high school All-American, and I didn't think I was going to start my senior year either. So I thought, well, it's time to move on. So how did you end up in Pittsburgh, and how did you end up getting involved with the Pittsburgh Steelers? Well, when I – it's very interesting. Again, when I first came to the University of Pittsburgh, I was recruited here by Peter Janetta, who was a very famous neurosurgeon at the time, and was doing some very creative things. And when I came, I took call for trauma. And the first five years I was here, a high school athlete from Western Pennsylvania was brought into the emergency room, quadriplegic, usually with a broken neck. And it was so tragic. And having played myself and realized how horrible this was for these young men. I, uh, I wrote a paper about the incidents of quadriplegia from football in Western Pennsylvania. And if you played then, you had a one in 12,000, one in 11,000 chance of being quadriplegic at the end of the season, which is horrible. So I started putting up on symposia for parents, coaches, trainers, how to protect the head and neck in football. Coach Chuck Knoll, who was the Super Bowl coach of the Steelers at the time, and Dan Rooney, the owner, contacted me and asked me to get involved with the Steelers in terms of managing concussions and brain and spine injuries. And that's, uh, that's how I got involved. So I was the first First neurosurgeon actually uh, recruited to be with an NFL team back in the 19, 
1980. At that time, the things that you were encouraging to protect the head and the neck, is it similar to what you see today or is it different? No, very different. I mean, Tim remembers you've had a concussion. How many fingers do you see? You can go back in. <laughs> I mean, that's how I it mean, was. And you remember that. I mean, the the stuff, I mean, the stuff that you were writing about in your papers to, to protect the head and the neck, were you saying things like taking the helmet out of the tackle or, or just being more strict on concussions? What, what were, what was it that you were saying in 79? Well, I, I used the Steelers as a lab actually. And, and we did, we published many things. We introduced the impact test, uh, immediate athletic cognitive testing, and this is now the standard of care in the NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball, NASCAR, 12,000 colleges. We've tested 23 million kids now baseline with this test. And due to Chuck Knoll, who encouraged, again, encouraged me and Mark Lovell, a neuropsychologist, to develop this. So we uh, we did that. And uh, so concussion management and also how to protect the head and neck, as you said, uh, not use the head as a battering ram. And we've recently introduced uh, the University of Pittsburgh Brain Bank. And we encourage athletes who have played football or any contact sport to donate their brains, as I have, uh, to the University of Pittsburgh Brain Bank so that uh, post posthumously uh you can we the families and every and de-identified but it, it's building up information on chronic traumatic encephalopathy how to prevent it what it means uh and you know individuals like myself who played many years uh tim yourself you know i i think it's very important it's something we can do after we pass on to, uh, to contribute back. You have been involved with the prevention and treatment of concussions since the early days. In your opinion, is it likely that all the concussions and tens of thousands of head collisions led to this trach in my neck? Well, you know, you, you're pretty cognitively aware after many concussions. You've had a very active and productive life. Uh, obviously, you're still very sharp processing information. I've had seven concussions myself. I'm 83. I'm still able to function, I think, at a fairly decent level. So uh, I, I think uh, because you've had several concussions doesn't mean you're going to develop chronic traumatic encephalopathy. There's a whole lot of information we need in that area, and that's a whole nother two hours of discussion. But that's why we started the University of Pittsburgh Brain Bank to gather, <laughs> to have people, you know, after they pass, to look at the brains in a very objective way. Uh, we're affiliated with 10 other institutions, so there's very high peer review in terms of what we'll find. Uh, in looking at individuals who have played contact sports. But do you think specifically to my dad, I think he, what he's saying is specifically about the, his ALS, do you think that's tied to the head collisions? You know, I don't think we know that for sure. I think uh, there's been some association. It's been suggested that there may be a relationship, a correlation, but obviously it's terribly important to to study that further mm -hmm. and uh and the and you know i've said how i how how that can be studied in the future i think it's important very important in the movie concussion starring will smith and alec baldwin your character played by arliss howard critics called an apologist for the nfl did you feel that you were misrepresented in any way? You, you, I was misrepresented in every way, not in any way. And uh, the producer took an incredible amount of liberty and uh, the director and, and the way I was portrayed. 
I just told you we've I've done more to prevent head and neck injuries in in athletics and all contact sports. It's been my whole career. So to be portrayed as they did uh, was very inappropriate. And uh, the reason that occurred is when the pathologist who reported on Mike Webster, uh, the first report of CTE in a professional athlete is what was purported. Uh, the He said that he thought this would be epidemic in the NFL and in all contact sports. And I, I said, I think to extrapolate from one case to an epidemic, was fallacious reasoning. And I still believe that. And I don't think it's an epidemic. And I think it needs much more study. It's a very important component. But uh, much, much more work needs to be done in that area. Did you talk with the producers or directors or anybody from the movie about, I guess, your frustrations, how they portrayed you? I did. Yes, I did. And I had extensive interviews before the script was written and uh, basically they needed a villain. And uh, I was portrayed as such very wrongly. At the age of 40, you lost your dad to a heart attack and your family, you said to a divorce, but you were like a Phoenix rising up to new heights. Your personal work on supplementation, exercise and diet seems like it has become your true passion. Am I correct? Well, yeah, I mean, that's correct. I had a, a life quake, a major adverse experience. And uh, fortunately, I, I was able, to, because of the help of a lot of good people and God, to come back to the most productive part of my life. And uh, I've been able to give back uh, for the last 40 years in, in many different ways. And uh, uh, I wrote a book entitled Square One, The Simple Guide to a Balanced Life that really is just that. It's about success, failure, and the simple guide to a balanced life. What was it at uh, the age of 40? What was the life quake, as you said? Well, my father died of a heart attack at age 60, very prematurely. And uh, my family broke up because I was working too hard and over overworked and overcommitted and burned out. And I ended up quitting neurosurgery and uh, working in a truck stop that my father bequeathed to my mother. A dirty, dilapidated truck stop, building up 18 wheelers and flipping hamburgers. For a year. So one week I was doing brain surgery uh, and taking care of professional athletes. The next, I was literally filling up 18 wheelers and flipping hamburgers in a truck stop. And that was because you were, you felt burned out at the. I was com depressed pathologically and simply couldn't function because of depression, anxiety, and a feeling of failure. What do you think brought that on? If you don't mind me, I'm, I know it's a very personal thing, but it was because I didn't have a good perspective. I, I, I strayed from my faith based upbringing. Uh, was not strong in terms of my family and I was committed to my career. Uh, and uh, there's a, a quote that I like every man's life is a diary in which he means to write one story, but oftentimes writes another. His humblest hour is when he compares the story as it is with what he vowed to make it. So I ended up working That's in a, a truck stop. Like where where did you get that from? That's James Barry, uh, a British writer. And uh, That's a really good one. I, I was able to put the family side of the square, the spiritual side, the physical side, and it was running that saved my life and triathlons. So the banker one day said, Hey, Joe, you need to go for a run. Who held the more, he held the mortgage on the truck stop. And I said, run, I can't walk up a flight of steps without 
being short of breath. But I found a pair of scrubs and tennis shoes and we went down to a local high school track in Wheeling, West Virginia. I made it around four times and said never again. I was exhausted, short of breath. <laughs> and uh, but that night was the first night I slept in months. So I went back the next day and I did a mile and a quarter. And then two, then three, then four. Pretty soon I started to cross train and got a bike, I rode my bike. Then I learned how to swim. And I entered into a very small triathlon, 300 meter swim, 10K bike, 5K run. And it was like Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile. So I kept, as the unintended side effect of running and biking and swimming, I was resetting my neurotransmitters, my serotonin level, my acetylcholine, my dopamine all went up without drugs. And I was able to rebalance my brain. And uh, I continued to the physical side, the spiritual side, reconnected with my family, redressed how I worked and uh, continued to train in triathlons and gradually raising the bar until I, uh, I was able to compete in Ironman distance races, uh, New Zealand, Germany, Australia, Canada, and Hawaii. So it's a quick turn. <laughs> you know, that's uh, how I pulled myself from the abyss. Would you recommend like to other people if they feel that burnout? A lot of people, I think today, especially with mental health, would you, if somebody came and asked you, do you recommend physical activity or running specifically? I, I would, I, I think aerobic activity is the most successful antidepressant there is. And there's many studies that show that it's better than SSRIs or Zoloft or uh, any of the drugs. So uh, it, the drugs didn't work for me. It was the aerobic activity, the progressive aerobic activity that rebalanced my neurotransmitters and got my heart working again, my brain working again. And that's why I still work out. You know, I know I have to do that to be working at peak performance. So it's diet. It's exercise, it's avoiding environmental toxins, controlling stress with spirituality, religion, and family, and getting adequate sleep. The secret to a balanced life. And I'm just uh, curious, whatever happened with the truck stop? Did you did it go well? Did you end up selling it? What happened? Ended up selling it, and it's a pit. <laughs> Yeah, got rid of it. <laughs> Around this time, you began working for the Pittsburgh Steelers as well. I am curious to whether this transformation or at any other point in your life, that religion played a hand. I say this because of the impact Christianity has had on my own life. I ask out of curiosity and without any judgment whatsoever. In fact, it was Jesus who warned, judge not lest you be judged. Well, I, uh, you know, I had... My first 12 years of schooling was with the Sisters of Charity. And uh, they inculcated certain values, Christian values. You know that many of us, when we get into our ambitions and our stories of success, one of the first things that slips away is faith and belief at times but i recall the saying there's no atheist in a foxhole and when you're really down and you're really out you know you fall back on those tenants those beliefs that made you who you are so to speak at least peace speaking personally and and that that's how it how it happened to me and it's become even more important 
um, sharing that with patients. And I frequently would pray with patients not to convert them to anything at all, but to one of the most effective anti-anxiety methods for an individual waiting on a gurney to go into an operating room to have their brain or spinal cord operated upon is a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear and uh, touching, praying, developing a, a spiritual relationship, not necessarily religious, but spiritual, uh, can be very therapeutic for the patient as well as the doctor. We were speaking with Troy Aikman on the podcast, and he's really into the anti-aging movement. We asked him if there was one thing he could single out that he felt was the most beneficial to him, and were surprised when he said drinking a lot of water. Troy and I read about the sauna and try to do three to four times a week. You obviously have more knowledge than the three of us put together. So will you give us your top five things to live longer? Yeah, I yeah, no question. It's we you you remember Coach Chuck Knoll, Tim? Absolutely. You know, he was four time Super Bowl winner the for the Steelers and you know, just a great coach. And he used to say football's not complicated. He says it's about blocking and tackling, and whoever blocks and tackles the best wins the game. And the secrets to longevity are not complicated either. Uh, first of all, have good genes. And that's something we can't choose. Uh, but only 10 to 20 percent of the diseases that we acquire are genetically determined. The other 80 percent are environmentally determined. And this is called epigenetics, above the genes, not genetics. So what are epigenetic factors that contribute to longevity? Number one is your diet. And a Mediterranean-type diet, appropriate supplements, uh, and uh, lean protein, wheat, no, you know, in, in terms of vegetables, greens, and we can go into that in great detail if you want, but basically a healthy diet. Number two is exercise, regular, aerobic, and uh, resistance types of exercises on a regular basis, three to five times a week. Number three, avoid environmental toxins, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, uh, clean air, clean water. Uh, Number four is controlling stress. Stress is neurotoxic to the brain, destroys brain cells in areas that control, control memory, emotion, uh, and strong families. The people who live the longest, centenarians, Okinawa, Sardinia, Nicoya in Costa Rica, Loma Linda, California, they all have strong family units and they're all very spiritual, which reduces and controls stress. And stress reduces cortisol and cortisol reduces adrenaline, et cetera, et cetera. And then getting adequate sleep. So those five pillars of success is what I write about in my book. The Longevity Factor, and also Square One, A Simple Guide to a Balanced Life. Why do you think, I mean, do you think the families is just about reducing stress, or do you think there's something else there? Well, there's so much there. I mean, so much there. I mean, it's, it, it's what you learn, it's how like you learn. To what? Purpose or something. I was saying, I wonder if it's some tied to like a purpose or something like that, something almost not. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, I think I think of the single mother with three kids working two jobs uh, on food stamps, trying to take care of any child. 
you know, in terms of the kind of family values that you got growing up, Troy, uh, mm -hmm. you don't have time for that. You know, they're in the streets. They're doing bad things, learning not good habits. So it's all about learning good habits. And that's family structure and grandparents when available. All of that contributes to, you know, how the how the wind blows, the tree grows. And uh, the the good values that you learn in a family, a strong family, and what you see, you'll you'll mimic. No water, no sauna. Uh oh. <laughs> no no water. Uh, yeah, when we had earlier. You mentioned we had we interviewed Troy Aikman. He said he thought it was drinking enough water. My dad and I were thinking that it was the sauna, and you gave five, and that we neither of those, none of those, neither of those made it. <laughs> well, I I think. <laughs> Water is part of food <laughs> and and a sauna, you know, and I think sauna is very therapeutic. Uh, I, I I prefer the steam room myself, but uh, I think a sauna has very therapeutic benefits and stresses the body in a good, positive way. And, and stress is good up to a point. As you know. I am curious how you became the medical director for the World Wrestling Entertainment, or WWE. What does that really entail? Well, I mentioned earlier that we've done considerable positive work relative to concussion prevention and treatment. And I was invited to, uh, to help with the wellness program of WWE about 16 years, 17 years ago. And we instituted a wellness program that I think is probably one of the best in all of sports and certainly entertainment, which is what WWE is. And uh, uh, it's a great organization and tremendous athletes uh, and very talented individuals. So it's been a great pleasure to be able to be associated with them for this period of time. So the wellness program is, I'm sure it's, it's gotta be very different than like a football wellness program, right? For the, for the WWE. Well, it's uh we, you know, it's uh drug prevention. It, we, we talk about diet uh, and we institute programs to prevent head and neck injuries, uh, how to manage concussions and uh, uh, a complete wellness program uh, in terms of the things I mentioned. What are your feelings about steroids and testosterone therapy? Also, what is the difference between them? Well, testosterone is a steroid. Uh, and I think if somebody's deficient in testosterone, just like if you're deficient in thyroid, uh, it's therapeutic. But to use it to build muscle mass or enhance strength, there are various, very significant side effects in terms of heart, liver, blood that can be very dangerous to an individual. So if you're low, I think it's therapeutic, but not for enhancing muscle mass. This might be a silly question, Dr. Maroon, but I've heard from a couple of people that if you're if people were to take like low doses of steroids, it would be actually be healthy for people's immune systems and strength and overall, like just overall health. But the fear is that people would abuse it. Is that true or is that just a, a myth? I, no, I think you any kind of low dose steroids, unless there's a therapeutic reason for it, are, are not indicated. Uh, you know, cortisone and, and, and various uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, Medrol dose packs that are prescribed like water. You know, unless you have a definite indication, it's not something that is going to enhance longevity or improve, increase performance. Dr. Moon, there's a lot of people now in like the longevity field. It seems like it's really exploded in the last few years, maybe since COVID. How do people tell, like, if for you know a listener or a viewer who's who's watching this or listening to this, how can you tell who's you know whose advice is the best or who's has the 
I guess who's legitimate and maybe who's not. There's people like Dr. Rhonda Patrick, David Sinclair, um, you know, Dr. Huberman does a lot of stuff like that. And I'm not saying any of those, those are all people that I personally listen to, but how would you recommend to somebody to uh, where to take advice from on longevity? Uh, read my book, Square One, A Simple Guide <laughs> to a Balanced Life. <laughs> That's, uh, that uh, setup. no, seriously, <laughs> it's uh, a very broad question, but I, I think honestly, the things to focus on, diet, exercise, avoiding environmental toxins, controlling stress, and getting sleep. Those are the five pillars that will prevent Alzheimer's disease, that will lead to peak performance, and it's tweaking that. So what you're asking, what's the right diet? What should I eat? What should I drink? And, uh, you know, I uh, uh, there are various supplements that I I think – are reasonable and valid and are therapeutic. Uh, polyphenols, various berries and fruits and this sort of thing are all very helpful. Omega-3 fatty acids, uh, fish oil, uh, the pro-health products with curcumin, turmeric, uh, magnesium. Uh, the, these are all products that I think add to uh, health and, and a healthier and longer life. Awesome. And then one other thing, uh, uh, Dr. Maroon, that we we ask people on the podcast is we try not to make it a ALS podcast or a health podcast or just athletes or just you know people. My dad knows we try to have like a very good um, mix of people just based on interesting people with interesting stories. So I want to ask you, who's somebody you think we should try to connect with and, and share their story? And David Sinclair, of course. Have you? And David, terrific guy. His book, Lifespan, I, I recommend to everybody. Uh, it's a very good book in terms of who to believe. You know, the way he writes, it's that's very good. Peter Atiyah, you know, he just shook, read his book. Very comprehensive, very well done. Um, there's a another neurosurgeon, Julian Bales, North Shore Hospital, is chairman of North Shore in Chicago, who's quite knowledgeable. So any and number of people. That, and Dr. Bales is how we got connected with you. So we interviewed him and he said you as his you were his uh, recommendation. <laughs> he said to try to reach out to you. Oh, uh, Julian, do you interview, did you interview Julian? Yeah, we did. Yeah. And he said, when I asked him the same question, he said to, to call you. <laughs> well, we pay each other back and forth. You know, he's my he's my PR director and I'm his. <laughs> I did. I forgot that, quite frankly. <laughs> Dr. Maroon, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for your valuable insights. Well, it's an honor and pleasure meeting you, Tim, and, you know, the adversity that you've you've you faced and. I had, you know, my prayers and admiration and respect certainly go to you. Thanks so much, Dr. Maroon. Great to meet oh. you and, uh, and have okay, some time to talk. Send me a copy of this, would you, if you would? Barclay Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarclayDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.